Thank you all for coming. It's been a crazy few years. Those of us working on decentralization have been charting out a path for us to get back to a vibrant, exciting future. We live in a centralized world. Over the past several decades, power has accumulated into the hands of large corporations, governments, and institutions. This concentration of power has made it difficult for the average person to find their place in the world, contribute in meaningful ways, and provide for themselves and their families. In 2015, Ethereum launched the first general purpose blockchain with smart contracts. For the first time, we had a way to get to global consensus with an expressive set of tools for programmable money and verifiable information. Much of our time is spent and coordinated on digital platforms. The web has a client-server architecture, which means whoever runs the server has complete control. They get to choose who can do what, who, says, who, who sees what, and even what information is considered the truth. But it doesn't have to be that way. Those of us in the crypto industry have been working on a, a new path forward. Web3 is a new platform for decentralized applications. By decentralizing the computing layer for applications, we can scale human coordination without giving power and control to specific companies and institutions. In 2017, a group of us saw the activity happening around Ethereum and decided to get involved. We believed in this decentralized platform vision. But we saw that developers were building normal centralized Web2 apps that just happened to use the chain for some things. They couldn't actually build decentralized applications because somehow they needed a way to get the data from the chain and organize it in order to feed into their applications. They ended up having to run their own servers and uh, that means that people needed to trust these teams. And so we weren't actually decentralizing power and control. We saw that, and that's when we started building the graph. The graph is a protocol for organizing public data and serving it in a completely decentralized way. It makes building decentralized applications easy and is a foundational layer of the Web3 stack. We've got a great set of talks throughout the day uh, to illuminate some of the technical challenges and what's been required to create this resilient indexing and query layer. It starts with subgraphs. Data on Web3 can come from a number of different data sources like blockchains and storage networks. That data needs to be processed and indexed so it can be efficiently queried by applications. Subgraphs define a subset of data that can be queried. The subgraph developer specifies what data sources they want to listen to, how they want to process that data, and then a GraphQL schema for querying that data. The subgraph can then be published to the network where anyone can use it as a building block. There are a number of roles that make this all possible. Indexers are the ones that run the servers that process and serve the data. Anyone with experience running servers or optimizing databases can be an indexer and provide this valuable service to the network. Delegators help to secure the network by delegating GRT to indexers. That lets the indexers serve um, more queries in the network. This way, delegators can factor in all kinds of external signals to allocate resources uh, to, to the best indexers. Anyone can publish a subgraph to the network, so curators are needed to sift through and organize the data on the graph. The curators signal on subgraphs that they believe are useful um, and should be indexed and used. The indexers have two sources of income, indexing rewards and query fees. The indexing rewards come from new token issuance created by the protocol. The amount of indexing rewards is proportional to the amount of curator signal on a given subgraph. That way, if a curator says that a specific subgraph is valuable, there are more incentives for indexers to come and pick it up, which creates a higher quality of service. The query fees can be paid by the end user or by the application. 
Delegators get a cut of the indexing rewards and the query fees, and curators get a cut of the query fees. That way, they're incentivized to find uh, the most valuable subgraphs that they think are going to drive real query fees to the network. So with these roles, rules, and incentives, we're able to create an economy where individual actors can self-assemble, each acting in their own self-interest, and we get a dynamic network that's able to create an incredible quality of service for organizing and serving all of the world's public information in a decentralized way. The network's been live for a year and a half, and there's now 167 indexers, over 9,000 delegators, and uh, 2.4 thousand curators. Uh, combined, um, these actors have staked just under half a billion dollars um, worth of GRT into the protocol. The network was built to support many billions of queries a day. The query fees are paid using state channels, which allows users to stream small micropayments with each query. In order to handle the volume of queries on the network, we had to develop a custom state channel solution called Scalar. Scalar's been in production uh, for the past year, and it's enabled us to have high-performance micropayments for queries and other Web3 interactions. Indexers on the network compete to provide the best service at the lowest price. They choose what subgraphs they want to index, and they can set their prices for queries granularly per subgraph or for a specific query shape. Optimizing databases is hard. Uh, tech companies have backend engineers and database administrators that you know, fine tune and optimize database access for their specific applications. The graph uses GraphQL, which is a flexible query language, but that does make it difficult to make sure that everything is running efficiently and with low latency. So with Agora, if an indexer can spot a slow running query, they can go in and optimize it and then charge more, uh, which allows them to, to become more profitable. Since all of the indexers are competing, uh, consumers are always getting the best possible service. A semiotic labs team is working on integrating machine learning um, to make this process um, even more efficient and automated. By having an efficient query market, we can scale a network to service every kind of application and completely remove the complexity of the infrastructure away from developers. The network currently uses gateways to help facilitate connecting to indexers. There are about a dozen gateways geographically distributed around the globe. When a, a user issues a query, it gets routed to the nearest gateway and from there to a nearby indexer. The gateways use an indexer selection algorithm that chooses the best indexer based on factors like price, performance, and economic security. By having a geographically distributed network, users in different countries are able to have much faster and better experience than they were before. The network has been scaling, and developers are building all kinds of amazing Web3 applications on top. ENS uses the graph network for their domain name registration service. Artblocks is a generative NFT project that uses the graph for their NFT marketplace. And Yearn uses the graph network for their DeFi aggregation protocol, and many, many others. If you're building a decentralized application, the graph network is ready for you to use today. Many of you know that Edge and Node, the company I work for, has been uh, operating a free hosted service that we actually launched at the first graph day in January 2019. Usage on the network has been picking up as developers have been migrating their subgraphs from the hosted service to the decentralized network. Not all of the query fees make it on chain, but uh, if we look at the billing contract on Polygon, we can see the rapid growth in query fees on the network. And this is just getting started. Performance on the network is comparable to that on the hosted service. You can see that both right now are doing around 
uh, 120 milliseconds um, latency on average, and, uh, and the decentralized network keeps getting faster. On the reliability front, they're also very comparable, sometimes with the network doing better, because you know, it's hard to maintain a hosted service no matter how you know, complex and geographically distributed it is. Uh, with the decentralized network and 167 indexers, there's, there's uh, almost always going to be someone available to service your query. And so this is pretty crazy. I mean, for years, people told us that there was no way to build a decentralized network that could be as fast and efficient as a centralized service. And we proved them wrong. The hosted service has been an incredible enabler. There have been tens of thousands of subgraphs deployed, and it's still seeing usage to the tune of billions of queries per day. From the first day that we announced the graph in 2018, we said that the hosted service would be a stepping stone to the decentralized network. We needed to make sure that we could get to the scale, performance, and reliability the developers expect before accelerating the transition. Well, today, I'm excited to say that we've met and exceeded our goals, and I'm thrilled to announce our plans for sunsetting the hosted service. <laughs> it's gonna be a gradual transition. The plan is to have the hosted service be sunset by the end of Q1 next year. Developers are gonna to continue to have access to Subgraph Studio, where they can build and test their subgraphs, and then when they're ready to go to production, that's the time to uh, publish to the network. Um, if you're using the hosted service today, there's nothing for you to do right now. Just keep an eye out for emails with instructions on next steps over the coming months. There's gonna be engineers and support people from the foundation and uh, the different core dev teams. Uh, here to help and to make sure that you and your users don't skip a beat. We can't wait to work with all the developers in the ecosystem to help you fully decentralize your apps with the Graph Network. Yeah. I just wanna take a moment to recognize every single person in this ecosystem that wakes up every day and makes a decision to contribute to this network without anyone telling them what to do. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for all of you. It's, it's really incredible to see that a decentralized protocol and ecosystem really is the best way to scale human coordination. A single team couldn't have done all this, and we're still just getting started. We've got a bunch of exciting developments in the works. As more blockchains and layer twos mature, there's gonna be more and more in data for us to index. We launched initially with Ethereum, and Near was the first non-EVM chain that we supported. Solana, Cosmos, and Polkadot, and others are gonna be up next. Keep an eye out for an announcement from Figment today. We wanna make using the graph as easy as possible. The Guild has been working on Graph Client, which is a new GraphQL library that can replace alternatives is the easiest way for developers to use the graph. We're excited to announce today that we're launching Graph Client 1.0. This stable release includes features like subgraph composition, indexer fallbacks, and caching. And over time, we're gonna be able to use Graph Client to help abstract away connecting to different chains, to add support for GraphQL mutations so we can handle writes to the chain as well as reads, and uh, to add client-side cryptographic verification. So this is a really great tool, and we're excited for developers to get their hands on it. The biggest pain point that we've heard from de developers has been indexing performance. Subgraphs process blocks linearly, which means that you know, if, if your contract has a lot of events, like ERC-20 token transfers or exchange swaps, 
uh, it can take weeks or even longer to process. The folks at Streaming Fast have been working on something really exciting. And today, I'm excited to announce Substreams. <laughs> Substreams is a new building block for high-performance, parallelized stream processing. Using Substreams as an input data source, developers can expect indexing speedups of up to 100 times for their subgraphs. It's still early, but uh, we're excited to make Substreams available to developers starting tomorrow at GraphHack. The Graph Protocol smart contracts are now are deployed on Ethereum mainnet. That makes transactions expensive for the different participants, like indexers, delegators, curators, and subgraph developers. But we've been hard at work, and today we're going to be announcing ex exciting new details about our uh, transition to Layer 2. Brandon Ramirez is going to be covering this and other protocol improvements in his talk later today. And if you want to learn more about Substreams, uh, Sebastian, a council member, is going to be uh, also diving into that in a talk later today. On the security front, the graph network uses crypto economic security. Every query response comes with a signed attestation that can be used uh, to, to launch a dispute against an indexer. An arbitrator set by governance and fishermen are required to enforce security in the network. This works, but it can be expensive to administer. Um, the Edge and Node team and the Semiotic Labs teams have been working together on some cutting edge cryptographic research around zero knowledge proofs. And today we're gonna be sharing new details about this work. You'll want to be here for a talk by Zach Burns later today to learn more. All information is relational and forms a graph. I'm a person. My name is Yaniv. I work at a company called Edge and Node. Edge and Node is a core dev at a protocol called the graph. These are all entities with relations to other entities or nodes with edges. And if you link all of these entities together, you can form a global graph, organized and served in a decentralized way. And that's the graph. And it's live and it works today. But what should we do with it? What should our goal be? As a society, our goal should be to help every individual reach their full potential. I'm sure you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, physiological needs at the bottom, social needs, self-actualization on top. Our goal should be to get everybody here, not just in the US, not as an East versus West thing, every person on earth. Importantly, every individual needs to decide for themselves who they wanna be and when they're self-actualized. Self-determination is key. Every good society aims to improve the well-being of its people, and they do so using the technology available at the time. We've gone through several technological ages with the advancement of technology. In the agrarian age, the invention of farming allowed them to feed many more people and create the first civilizations. Agrarian societies were mostly centrally managed and controlled. The industrial age saw inventions like electricity, steam, power, steel, petrochemicals, and capital markets to scale human coordination with corporations. A tremendous amount of wealth and prosperity was created, lifting quality of life across the board, and this is still mostly the, the age that we're in. Now we've started the transition to the knowledge age, and the knowledge age is going to be different. Thanks to computers, the internet, and rapid advancements in software, capital is no longer the limiting constraint. It's now human attention and deciding what it is that we want. We could transition to a post-scarcity world of abundance beyond our wildest dreams, 
but we've been stuck. Stuck because society is still centered around industrial age institutions. Here, I'm just gonna look at the US as an example. Schools look just like assembly lines that we, we just push people through. In the US, the average student loan debt balance is $37,000. Many people graduate school hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. Then you're supposed to join a large corporation and work your way up the corporate ladder. Hopefully you got perfect grades. You know, corporations used to be the most efficient way to scale coordination, but now these things have gotten big, slow, and bloated with red tape, bureaucracy, politics. Small teams where people have a high degree of trust and alignment is a much better way to organize. It used to be that if you wanted to uh, go off and start a company, you could go to a, a bank and get capital. But as the economy has gotten more co uh, complicated, it's harder for banks to understand all the different types of businesses and underwrite risk. Even venture capital is wildly inefficient. The reality is that it's hard to get capital into the hands of people who deserve it. While all of this is going on, maybe you want to read the news to try to understand what's going on in the world. A lot has been said about the decline in journalism. Can anybody confidently say that they understand what's going on in the world and that they know the facts? And then we have religions. I respect everybody's right to practice their religions. I just want to point out that in the US, church, synagogue, and mosque attendance has declined from about 73% in 1937 to around 47% today. No doubt there's wisdom in scripture, but it could be that some of this is because it's hard to apply texts that are thousands of years old to our modern, modern lives. And it's clear that people need a strong moral framework, a spiritual connection to something greater than themselves, and a feeling of community and belonging. Without those things, societies quickly decay. Whether it's from one of the existing religions or from something else, we could really use a strong framework of values and a spiritual revival to support people's well being and to help navigate difficult decisions. And finally, nation state governments. Did you know that Congress's approval rating is 18%? That's crazy. The way that we make and vote on laws is fundamentally broken. Why is this something that happens in back rooms where they shove all kinds of unrelated items into these multi-thousand page bills that are all or nothing? Where does the money go? And then we get to vote on representatives every few years from a limited set of parties. There's a 0% chance that if you were designing a government system today, post internet, that this is a system you would design. So, these are the institutions. How should we organize in the knowledge age? The answer is protocols. Protocols are a new organizational structure. They allow you to build internet native institutions that are open, transparent, and fair. They create permissionless jobs so anyone can contribute to the areas they care about. We can have protocols for every single mission from combating climate change to any homelessness. We believe that humanity can solve any challenge with the right incentives and coordination tools. But first, we have to fix the incentives. When you're looking for a job, you wanna look at these, these three things. What you're good at, what you love to do, and what the market will pay you to do. And of course, you wanna look for the intersection. Now, all of these take work, but the hard part is the bottom right here. Right? There are plenty of things that people would want to do that would genuinely be valuable for society, 
but that they can't get paid to do. We call that a market failure. Today, we use the free market to distribute products and services. And whenever there's a clear relationship between a buyer and a seller, the free market works great. But when there isn't a clear relationship, like when a lot of people can benefit from a product or service, then that thing becomes a public good. And right now, we rely on governments to distribute funding for public goods. And we also rely on governments to set public policy. And as we've just seen, governments are not incredibly effective. With protocols, we can use fees for products and services, much like query fees in the graph or transaction fees with blockchains. And then we can use rewards to administer public goods, much like uh, indexing rewards in the graph and block rewards uh, in blockchains. Because we have programmable money, we can build much more sophisticated mechanisms to design the incentives that we want. We can also use protocol governance to help set public policy with real-time voting systems that are cryptographically secure. Unlike shareholders with corporations or voters in governments, we can design these governance systems carefully to properly represent all of the different stakeholder groups in a given ecosystem. How would you distribute power in such a system? I would argue as broadly as possible, but based on merit. By creating open protocols that anyone can contribute to and putting power into the hands of those who've earned it, we can create a civilization that can improve the quality of life for every person on Earth. And today, I'm excited to unveil the next step. It's called, it's called GEO. Let's roll a clip. Geo is a Web3 browser built on the graph. <laughs> it's a window into a new world, a decentralized world. When you land on the home page, you see a gallery of pages. These are like web pages, but they're graph pages. See, the web is fundamentally broken. If you ever want to know why you're seeing what you're seeing on the web, the answer is always because the server says so. You have to deal with trackers, ads, pop-ups, and you're always at the mercy of some corporate overlord. In Geo, the pages are open and curated by the community. If you want to know why you're seeing what you're seeing, you can inspect the query and it's all secured by the graph. We wanted to create the best possible experience for browsing Web3, and so we made a native app that's iPad first. We can navigate to pages, and you can pinch to swipe out and navigate to uh, your recent pages. This also works on Mac using the trackpad for multi-touch. Let's take a look at a page here for values we can see some tables with different values, like individuality and progress. Values are now entries in a global database that anybody can reference. We can rank these, and we can 
reference them when we're trying to make difficult decisions. Let's take a look at another page. We'll hop over to the policy page. Here, we can set and discuss public policy decisions, starting with content moderation, a big problem on the web. Here, we can define different policy groups for jurisdictions, like the US federal government, or iOS store distribution requirements, or more restrictive set of policy groups, like respect and safety, really to, to people's preference. Then people can label different pages as being against specific moderation rules, and then the apps and the users can filter to just show um, uh, the relevant content. Uh, but now, we can put the power in people's hands in making these decisions. Uh, it's no longer something that needs to be done in you know, back, back rooms where we don't understand how these decisions are being made. In GEO, every page is editable, subject to reputation-weighted voting. Let's go ahead and propose a rule that we'd like to add to the rules table here. We just hit the edit at the top and we scroll down and we can go ahead and add a rule right into the table. Let's say that we think it's important for people to respect each other's privacy in public settings. And we can uh, add the appropriate policy group. And um, now we can head over to the publish screen where we can see all of the pages that we've edited locally. Let's go ahead and, and publish our change here. We can add as many pages, as many edits as we want into a single proposal. We can add a name to our proposal and add a description. And then we're gonna publish our change to the blockchain uh, so that people can vote. Once we've added our description, we can hit the publish button and boom. What you just saw there is we used face ID to authenticate, to sign the proposal with our private key and publish it to the blockchain. And you didn't have to know anything about crypto or blockchain in order to do that. This is truly an experience that can onboard the next billion users to crypto. Now we're here in beautiful San Francisco you know, it really is a beautiful city, but it has its problems. And we at Edge and Node want to use these powerful new tools to make a change. And if you want to change the world, you've got to start at home. And so we've been working with the Root Foundation on outlining a set of goals that we can focus on to try to improve the city of San Francisco. And hopefully this, this is something that other people can replicate and do in their own cities. So let's uh, jump over and take a look at some of these goals. Why don't we look at public safety? Here you can see a page. It's got some metrics and some data points. And let's go ahead and add a metric. So we can hit the edit button. We can click on one of these metric slots and we get a data source browser or we can pull data from any subgraph. Or people can manually enter data into tables into Geo, and we can pull data from one of those tables. So we'll go ahead and do that. And we just added a metric to the page here. And so just like that, we can lay out different dashboards. We can add metrics, charts, galleries, all kinds of content into these beautiful pages that people can use to organize all of the world's knowledge and information in a completely decentralized way. For the voting, uh, we've started out using a very simple reputation system. It's all on chain. And um, it's based on the amount of content that you add to the app. But in the future, we want people to be able to design their own reputation systems using subgraphs. See, that's exactly what subgraphs are meant for. Right? What's reputation if not a view 
on events that have taken place. And so if you want to have different weightings to different types of actions and design your own reputation systems, you can do that right inside of subgraphs. Let's take a look at uh, what it looks like to, uh, to vote on a proposal here. If we uh, go over to the vote screen, we can see uh, a proposal that somebody else has made, and we can see the diffs with the before and an after of the change. We can review to see if this looks good, and if so, we can hit approve, jump back over to the publish screen, where we can see our votes at the top there. You can batch as many of these up. Boom, you just hit publish, and you've submitted your vote to the chain. So just like that, we can organize all of the world's public knowledge, serve it in a decentralized way, browse it through a beautiful new interface, and organize to solve the world's biggest challenges. We're really excited for people to get their hands on this. Um, when it becomes available to the public, it's going to be available through the App Store for $5 a month. Now, it costs money to run software. And what we've learned is that you're either the customer or you're the product. And we don't think people should be you know, products anymore. And so we should pay for the services that we consume. We want the users to be in control. So you know, $5 a month to be in control. When this goes GA, it's going to be open source. So you can run it yourself, and you can modify it, remix it. It's going to be available in beta for everybody that's joining us at GraphHack tomorrow. And for everybody else, you can join the beta waitlist at edgeno.com slash geo. I just want to give a big thank you to the Geo team and the whole Edge and Node team. They worked so hard to get this out. Let's give them a big round of applause. For those of you that are just now starting out, you're not crazy. The system is broken. But it's OK, because we can fix it. We can build a better one. When the better represents our values. And we can do it in the open, so it's transparent and everyone can participate. We want everyone to be able to contribute, but we should acknowledge some basic truths. It's hard to truly know anything. Those that have become knowledgeable in any domain know what it took to achieve that. We don't want to relegate truth to authorities. The truth can come from anywhere. But there is such a thing as knowledge, and there is such a thing as ignorance, and they're not the same. Love is better than hate. Knowledge is better than ignorance, and decentralization will set us free. If we follow those values, we can all live richer lives. The journey starts within. When we're young, we build up walls defense mechanisms that protect us. But as we get older, those defenses get in the way and prevent us from seeing things clearly, the way they really are. You have to look inward and see and accept your weaknesses and disadvantages and face your fears. It's going to hurt, but when you do, you can tear down your walls and truly be present in the world. You can stop blaming other people for your hardships because you have all the power. Once you've done the work, you can go out into the world and try all kinds of things and discover your passions. Choose a mission and find like-minded people who complement you. You'll be able to work closely together and grow thanks to your inner work. You can develop skills and push yourself to always be better and better. The, the time between the vision you have in your head and seeing it materialize in the world will get shorter and shorter until one day you wake up in a dream of your own making. And that's self-actualization. 
Everyone can get there, but we have to work together. Right now, we're divided. Left and right are split down the middle and torn apart. Each side has tribal affiliations, but underneath are simple personality traits that add value in their own ways. Liberals are idealistic. They strive for a world where we care for those in need. Conservatives are practical. They understand that there are constraints to human nature, and if we're not careful about how we change things, we can cause harm. The truth is, we need each other. And if we work together, we can make things better while navigating reality. We're about to enter a period of change. There are going to be those that try to use this opportunity to exact vengeance on those they think are responsible for their pain. They'll call these people oppressors and seek revenge. When you hear those calls, be a voice of reason. We can't fix things by punishing those that came before. No, we make things right by building a better system and bringing everyone with us. There's more than enough in this world of abundance for everyone. In the pages of Geo on the graph, we can see the blueprint for a better world. But here's the thing. The pages are blank. It's up to you to fill them out. Fill them with your knowledge. Color them in with your dreams. Design the world you want to live in. And if we onboard enough people, we can make it so. There's a lot we have to unlearn. Many of the ideas of the past are no longer going to serve us where we're going. We have to be bold and view things through fresh eyes. Our only limits are our imagination, physics, and human nature. So much is possible now. So get ready. We're embarking on a journey, a wonderful adventure where the light of humanity can flourish to new heights, and it's all happening now. Thank you.